and I don't understand all of it, and I, I like to walk in a simple place with my faith. I don't have to understand it. Uh, I just want to hold on to God because he's good. And there are, there's so many things in the Bible. Today we're going to be talking about miracles and healing. I don't understand that. I just go before God and I believe it. He's, it's in the Bible. I come before God and I always want to endeavor to have a simple faith like a child saying, Lord, it's here. I believe it. Where's your hand? I need somebody's hand to hold on to and, uh, and, and go forward in faith. So, brothers and sisters, how many are grateful that grace brought them here today? You can do better than that. Who's grateful that grace brought them here today? Amen. Amen, right? We don't deserve to be called Christians. We don't deserve to sit in this holy place and, and sing songs to the God of the universe. Why would he care? Why would he listen to us? It's grace. It's the cross. The cross is all about God saying, I know how messed up you are. That's why I'm paying for it. I know how messed up you are, and I want you. God sees us at our worst. And he says, I want you for mine. You're going to be my daughter, my son. And so today we're together. We're united by the blood of Jesus Christ. Each one of us in this room, we're all different kinds of people. That's a beautiful thing. We have all have different struggles. And that's, that's a wonderful thing too because we found our, our unity and we found our answer in Jesus Christ, God who cared enough for us to come down, humble himself, uh, get rid of all the prerequisites of his glory, suffer, suffer for you and I, give his life so that we could be united with him for eternity. We have such a good God. The title of today's sermon is When the Master Calls You Friend. When the Master Calls You Friend. I, I uh, with all my nastiness, and Yumi could tell you more than anybody, with all my wretchedness, with all my uh, internal struggles, with all the darkness in my heart. I am somebody who stands before you, and I believe, because the Word of God tells me, that God calls me friend. I believe that heaven rejoices over everyone who brings, uh, comes to him in faith. Heaven rejoices over you. God is pleased that you've committed your life to him. This week... I further beat myself up emotionally by spending many hours, I mean hours this week, reading and uh, watching videos about the underground church in the Middle East and in China and North Korea and uh, struck by their determination, their love for their country. And I always say, I'm a patriot and I love the United States of America. And if you are a Christian in England, I hope you love England. If you're a Christian in Poland, I hope you love Poland. And seeing these Chinese Christians crying out to, to God, please save China, let the sun rise on China. And, and the, North, uh, the North Korean Christians crying out, Aboji, Aboji, which is Father, Father. Uh, they longing to see uh, North Korea saved. And there was this beautiful scene where they were... Uh, interviewing North Korean Christians, and all you'd see is their shadow because they don't want their face to be shown. North Korea, more than any Muslim country, and there's Muslim countries that are slaughtering Christians, North Korea, becoming a Christian is your death warrant. And still, there's about half a million North Korean Christians. You know, what you, you know what, where most of those Christians, how most of those people became Christians? Because there's a fairly new development. North Koreans that escape across the border into China becoming Christians in China because Christianity is booming there, even despite Chinese persecution, and then going back, even though they know if they're caught, it's the death penalty, going back to North Korea. And so there's underground churches rising. And, you know, we call, the Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. And there was this beautiful scene with a, a shadow of a North Korean traditional dancer, dancer, and it says that the bride of Christ in North Korea rises and dances, and it's in Korean, but the English subtitles on the bottom. It was beautiful to think of the bride of Christ in all these different countries, so different in God. Jesus Christ pleased with his bride. You know, I don't understand Christians who say, I love God, but, but then badmouth the church. It's the bride of Christ. I don't want to badmouth his bride. That would be a very, very foolish place to be. And so just moved by the determination and the strength and the courage and, and Christians talking in China about how they were electrocuted and thrown in jail 
one pastor was almost moved to tears. He says, I'm so weak. I, I prayed to God, I want to follow you, but I'm afraid that the 11th time in jail will be too much for me. <laughs> I can't bear it physically anymore. And so he'd been into jail so many times, and their love for Christ and their gratitude for his salvation in the cross. And I cried so hard this week and again because I think what's going on with my brother and all the other things that's going on. And cried so, so hard and so often that my eyes were actually aching. <laughs> Uh, that my eyes were in pain. And I know our situation here in America is different. Their situation is deadly because of persecution. Our situation is spiritually dead, deadly for other reasons. And, uh, and I think we need to delve into that. But, but we are blessed in America. The American church is financially blessed more than at any time in the history of Christendom. We are blessed with incredible freedoms, blessed with Bibles everywhere, uh, so many Bibles in, in our homes, and yet, where are they? Are they on the shelves? Are they gathering dust? Are they in our hands? Churches everywhere, even though they're closing at an astounding rate in the United States, still, we have churches everywhere. Uh, I remember uh, I took a, a trip from from Japan with about 30 or 40 Japanese Christians, and we were going to a conference for Campus Crusade for Christ, which Chet was a, a part of, and uh, meant much of his sermon last week was sharing some crusade ideas. And, and we were going to this conference where there was going to be 30,000 Korean young people on fire, and they were going out to share the gospel. And as we were going, we were in, in the bus, and, and I remember the Japanese Christians were just going from one side of the bus. There's another cross. There's another church. And I, we grew up and we see churches everywhere. But in Japan, it's less than 1% Christian. And they were just almost in tears to see so many churches everywhere and so blessed about that. We have churches in America. We have seminaries that Christians from around the world come to to learn uh, of the Word of God. We have preaching on TV. We have preaching on the radio. We have preaching on the Internet. My question is, if God has blessed us so much, and he has, shouldn't we be even more grateful than the Korean Christians or the Chinese Christians? Shouldn't we be even more in love with Jesus than the underground churches of China, North Korea, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia with all of our freedom and lack of physical persecution? Shouldn't we be even more faithful to share the love of Jesus? What's holding us back? Shouldn't we be even more eager to pray with people and to bring them to church? And I saw a video of Chinese Christians singing about church, and they were saying, here is a place of love. And some of them had tears in their eyes, and there was, it was a big room. I think this was a, not a house church, but, a, but it looked like an official church. And the, here is a place of love, and isn't that beautiful? And that was Christ's will for the church from the very beginning. Here is a place of love. And if we're not loving one another, we're doing it wrong. What are the things that destroy love? And should they? And we see our brothers and sisters in doing so much persecution. And what's throwing us off of our walk? John 15, please listen as I read. John chapter 15 from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither you can bear fruit, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And as the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy 
may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We, we talk about rules, right? And we call it legalism. Jesus says, if you're in me, you can ask for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Because when we're loving God, we love the things that God wants and our prayers align with his will. He says, if you want joy, obey me. God says, I know the way I've created people. Don't, do you have, is there a lack of joy in your life? Is it because you're running from me, fighting with me, rebelling? My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Follow me. Love me. Jesus said, you're my friends. I no longer call you servants. And again, we hit on this when we were studying the book of Hosea, and I said, I couldn't get away with saying this if the Bible didn't say it. This is really odd. God says, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Jesus wants us to know our master's business. Instead, I call you, I have called you friends. For everything that you learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Second time he says it. This is my command. Love each other. Boy, that's like the third or fourth time you said that. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. It's an easy thing to throw fellow Christians under the bus because we disagree with some of their theology. Easy thing to throw Christians out the, under the bus because they've got those really weird hairstyles. Uh, easy to throw Christians out of the, under the bus because they, they talk different, dress different, act funny, and we want to be accepted by our cool, we think, non-Christian friends. I don't want to take my cues from somebody that doesn't love Jesus and is on their way to hell unless they turn and repent. And I don't want to, I, will, I can disagree with other Christians, and I do, you know that. But I don't want to throw them under the bus just to try to get popular with non-Christians. Jesus commands us to love one another. It's a command. And he said, if we're doing it right, the world, they persecuted me, Jesus said, they're going to persecute you too. We spend so much time uh, trying to earn the love of people who aren't going to love us if we follow Christ, and meanwhile, uh, making fun of other Christians. Let's not do that. Let's be smarter than that. Let's be wiser than that. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 14. So poor Jerry. Uh he and Aaron and John and, and you know, they just want to have a good time once a year. Just once a year. And so Jerry's having a good time with his friends and on vacation, right? He's here every week, but he's on vacation. And we call him uh, because Toriano came to, to the church and he found that those vents on the top of the roof during the heavy winds had blown off and <laughs> fell into the street or something. Toriano got it for us and and because everybody else is inept, I guess, I know I am, Jerry gets up on that roof and puts it on for us. That was yesterday, I think. And then uh, we all come to church today, and I'm not expecting to see Jerry. I'm happy to see Jerry. I'm not expecting to see Jerry today. And I get here, and people say, don't worry. We've already called Jerry. <laughs> the heat's not working. <laughs> oh. And I felt bad for my brother, but I was happy to see him. And the heat's on. He is working. Yay, Jerry. I trust that the Lord will bless you beyond what you've missed out on. So. The setting for Luke chapter 14. 
Jesus has been invited to the home of a religious leader, a Pharisee. But although this man and his friends are very, very religious, they aren't close to God. They're, they don't recognize who Jesus is. Did you catch that? It's possible to be very religious, to, to be a church person, to be very spiritual. You hear that phrase a lot? I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. It's possible to be all these things and not close to God. And so Jesus, as he always does, he loves them enough to say the uncomfortable thing. He wasn't here trying to beat up the Pharisees. The Bible tells us that after Christ's resurrection, a number of the scribes and Pharisees actually come to faith in Jesus. He wasn't here hating these folks because we always talk about Pharisees and Puritans like we hate them. We know nothing. We shouldn't talk like that. Jesus loves the Pharisees, and that's why he said these very, very difficult things to them, things that were painful and harsh for them to hear, but that they needed to hear. The topic that Jesus is driving home, how to get right with God so that we can enter the kingdom of God and join in what we now call the marriage supper of the Lamb, the big celebration, the big party. And I don't want to talk about whether the, the marriage supper is just a symbol of fellowship with God or if there's actual meal there. I don't know. But the idea is, throughout the Old Testament, it talked about this time when God's going to gather his people together, and they were looking forward to a marriage supper with the Lord. And now in the New Testament, we know this is Jesus Christ who's going to wed his bride, all those who are faithful uh, to Jesus Christ, and there's going to be this great celebration. The discussion is kicked off when Jesus, Jesus heals a sickly man, and he does so on the Sabbath. Jesus has stirred up trouble like this before in Luke uh, on, by healing, working on the day of rest, the Lord's day, by uh, casting out demons or he helping people. We saw that in chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 13, and now again in chapter 14. So this is a common theme. Uh, Jesus is going to work. God is going to work on the Lord's day. The folks around him weren't happy about that. Aren't you very glad? We're at church today, and we believe that God works on the Lord's day. I mean, thank goodness. You'd hate to be at church and God never works. Uh, so let's turn to Luke chapter 14, 1 through 6. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, so an important person, he was being carefully watched. Now, he wasn't being carefully watched because people wanted to learn. He wasn't being carefully watched because people wanted a blessing. Brothers and sisters, we can do this at church too. Go and watch to see if the worship team screws up. Go and watch to see if we don't like what's in Sunday school class. Be that very, very critical, trying to be criticize what the pastor is saying, instead of going to ble be blessed and to receive. So Jesus was being watched very carefully but boy, their hearts were not right with God. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body, or maybe your translation says dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Well, they kind of don't like the way you phrase that question, but they remain silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Uh, yeah, I like the way Jesus is always touching people. We can go through our lives and touch almost nothing living day after day. It's, it's wood or even less than dead living things. It, if you don't have a pet, <laughs> you're touching your keyboard, you're touching the door handle, water faucet, car steering wheel. We often don't touch living things, and oftentimes we avoid to have come in contact with human beings. Jesus Christ did not have to lay hands on this man to heal him. He was loving him. He was affirming him. He was saying, I'm with you. Uh, what a beautiful and wonderful thing. This man suffered from something called dropsy or edema. It's often related to congestive heart failure. It's where you've got too much water retained and your skin gets puffy and bloated, and you push down, and, and it, your skin doesn't stay the way it's supposed to. It just stays a little dent. So you put all these dents all over yourself, and it, it's, it's a sad sickness. Often, 
it will progress and, and then lead to death. This fellow's in a tough spot. Jesus sees him, and Jesus has compassion. Now, I want us to get the point here correct. Jesus could have healed everybody in the world, but he didn't. Uh, we believe in healing. And did you know that the Bible actually commands us to pray for healing? So it's not a question of, well, I don't understand how that works. Do it, because God commanded it. However, don't get caught up in Jesus' healing in the miracle. What Jesus is showing them is God's heart, his love. That's the main point here. We need to see his heart for this hurting person and to know God has the same heart for us. And he's not playing the religious game. He's not playing church. It's God in flesh, and he wants to love people and bless people. And if we have a church, let's not play games. And let's, the Pharisees, what was wrong with them? They were set in their traditions. They were set in the way they do things, so full of religion that they didn't have a heart for people. And Jesus said, I'm here to serve. And when we get together, if we're all in our own kingdoms, if we're all like sumo wrestlers sitting, we're going to be crashing into each other. There won't be enough room in the pews, right? But if we let the Holy Spirit deplete our ego, we're going to be here. And I'm here not for myself. I'm here to bless you. And you're thinking, I'm not here for myself. I'm here to bless the person behind me and the person next to me and the person in front of me. We're here for one another. Bring joy to one another. Encourage means to grant courage to one another because it's hard to live in a world that persecutes believers. Let's love one another and lift each other up. And then the church shines and it's what Jesus intended it to be. And it's like a beacon that draws people to Christ. These religious leaders cared more about their religious set ways than they did in caring for people that God loves, people that Jesus was going to die for. Dear Christian, our religion is not about ourselves. It's not about our traditions. It's not about the way things have been. If our religion is all about me, is my religion all about me? Or do I feel a compulsion in my heart driving me to care for others? This is, uh, you know, I'm going to confess something. And normally when I confess something, it means I really screwed up. <laughs> Today I'm going to confess something where I think I do pretty good on this, but I'm not doing as well as I should. And sometimes God just grabs a hold of me. Uh, I love people. God's, it's just easy for me to love people. We struggle with different things, but God's given me a heart for people. I cheer for people. I cheer for you. I, I pray for you. And, and, and I want to see you shine for Jesus Christ. But every once in a while, Dan, God has to take me and lovingly just go like this to me. It's something very much like that. It says, Dan, it's not about your ministry. It's about loving people. Get your heart right again. Oh, yeah. Thank you, God. Because that's what I want to do, and that's easier. That's, I love doing that better. If you're serving, Sunday school class, cooking, breakfast, small groups, worship team, announcements, that's not you. You're doing that to be a blessing. You're doing that to serve the Lord. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about us together. <laughs> And that's beautiful. That's the way God intended it. So is my faith driving me to deflate my pride, care about others, to live first and foremost? I want God to be glorified. Whether I'm in the hospital, whether it's my birthday party, whether I'm at the restaurant, whether I'm in the line at the grocery store, Watch how you behave, dear Christian, in the line at the grocery store. Your job is to glorify God. And it should be my passion. I want to bring glory to God, uh, even hold the door open for somebody, to bring joy to the heart of God. Do you want to bring joy to God's heart? Or do you want him to be saying, boy, you're getting it wrong again, Dan? These Pharisees were in the presence of God himself, God incarnate. But they were not humble. They were watching them to mess up. They missed it. 
I don't want to miss it. And my prayer is, church, we don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss it. And I'm, I'm jealous for the heart of God, and I'm jealous for Christianity in America, and I don't want to be put to shame by Christians in other countries that are suffering for Jesus Christ and can still get together and rejoice. I want to rejoice right here, right now. I want love to be here, right here, right now. And I want God to look down and be pleased with us. Let's look at, uh, at Luke chapter 14, 7 through 11. Today's just a nice, simple message we're going through. Uh, looking at this, this love from God when he calls us friend. 7 through 11. When he, Jesus, noticed how their guests picked their places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may be also have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This reminds me of James 4.10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And uh, This section used to bother me, uh, even though... I've loved these verses, and it's, it's influenced my life. And I often hear God telling me, Dan, step back. You don't need to put yourself forward. Uh, if people have spiritual eyes, they'll see your value. They'll see your worth in time. You don't have to sell yourself to people. And there have been times when I've waited months or years for people to say, oh, you love Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, fellow Christians not noticing or recognizing. Uh, sometimes people look down at us because they don't understand us. Jesus said, don't put yourself forward. You don't need to glorify yourself. But this verse, these verses bothered me because I thought, well, what is this? Is this Jesus telling us how to, is this etiquette? <laughs> is, is he just now suddenly becoming like a, a Dear Abby column? I'll tell you what to do when you go to a wedding. Don't sit at the important spot. Sit kind of back. And, and then this week, the message was very difficult coming together this week, and I was listening to a pastor named Utley, and he noticed, he brought out how all of this is about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus is already talking about the marriage supper in heaven here, and what he's talking about is not just proper etiquette. He's talking again about spiritual humility. If you humble yourself, God will lift you up. Who's invited to the wedding not the people who think that they're important. Jesus is talking to Pharisees who think they're all that. He's saying, don't put yourself forward. Instead, I want you to be humble. And if you are humble, guess what? The master is going to say, friend, why don't you come up with me? Don't you want Jesus to say that to you? We can be stuck in religion. We can be stuck in our own self-importance. And instead, God will send us away. I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about how you become a Christian. Humble yourself, and God will lift you up. But if you think, well, I'm an American, so I deserve to go to heaven. It's my birthright. Jesus was talking to them and saying, just because you're Jewish, just because you're a Pharisee, doesn't mean that you get to sit at the front. In fact, you have to humble yourself before the living God. If you want God to call you a friend and say, come on up here with me, we have to humble ourselves. We have to put down our pride and accept his invitation. Uh, look at 12 through 14 now. And Jesus said to his host, continuing this theme, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So again, Jesus is talking to them about humility, right? And, but this is not just talking about what to do with your parties. This is not party etiquette. There's something more going on here. And, and Jesus is saying, 
Open up your homes to, to people that are, are less acceptable. Open up your homes to, to the outcasts. Open up your homes to people. What do, you, what do you got when you get people that are out on the streets? They, they, they don't smell good, you know. I want you to love people that are not accepted, in other words. Because otherwise, if you're just hanging out around with important people, I want to be seen with important people because it's good with my image. I want to be with rich people because then I can get stuff. Jesus says, you're getting your reward, but if you care about these other folks, you will be repaid at the, at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, uh, your translation may say at the resurrection of the just. If I were Jesus, I would have changed the Bible, and I would have said uh, at the resurrection of those made righteous or at the resurrection of the justified, but this is the way Jesus said it. And the just, the righteous, are the people that have been uh, saved by Jesus Christ. Uh, but look at what he's talking about. Because if he's thinking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, if that's what he's trying to teach the... And by the way, uh, that last parable where Jesus said, uh, don't sit at the front, sit at the back, that wasn't even a parable original with Jesus. Uh, the, that was a, a, a rabbinical teaching the rabbis were teaching this, and they also taught, sit, the rabbi said, sit at a place about three seats down from where you think you should be seated so that they can uh, bring you up and you'll have honor instead of being pushed back. And so Jesus is taking that parable, which they all would have known, and is trying to teach them something about God as the master saying, friend, come up here, and it starts with humility. And now he's also working with their humility and saying, I want you to hang out with the, the people that don't have it all together. But think of this in terms of God inviting us up to heaven. God doesn't invite people who think they can repay him. God is not inviting people who think that they're on an equal place with him. Like, God, you've got to let me in because I'm so righteous. God, you've got to let me in because I'm so good. God is inviting the spiritually crippled. God is inviting the person who's an outcast. God is inviting the person who knows they're messed up and worthless. And these are the people that are being invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you want to be invited to heaven? You have to be humble enough to understand your brokenness. 15 through 24, parable of the great banquet. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. See, they knew what he was talking about. Oh, he's talking about the heavenly feast. And they got that. And so he's listening to Jesus. And uh, yeah, humble stuff, humble stuff. But yeah, but blessed are those. And of course, they thought, and we're going to be there. We are part of the people that are in the in crowd. Blessed are the people who are going to eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. So listen, Jesus replied, he says, let me explain this to you, because I don't want you to miss it. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. This is the heart of God calling people to his banquet, to his party in heaven. I want you to come. Everything is now ready. The time is right. But they all alike began to make excuses. What have we said here before? You don't need to be particularly intelligent to make an excuse to stay away from God. Even with a little bit of creativity, you can find a reason not to be a Bible study, not to pray, not to read your Bible, not to go to church. We, we are experts at finding reasons and excuses to avoid God. And they all alike began to make excuses. But the first, uh, the first said, I just bought a field and I have to go see it. So this is a material thing, a physical thing. I have this, and I need to go check out what I just bought. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. You know, you buy a new car. You want to open it up a bit. You want to try it out. This fellow's got five new oxen. He's got to see how these babies go. Uh, God's not going to be pleased with this. So the first one, material things. Now here it's work. He's going to use the oxen for his fields. Uh, this is an excuse. Uh, another said, uh, uh, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. I'll tell you what. There's things that you see as a pastor over the years, uh, and, and they're heartbreaking. I've seen people 
that are struggling with financial situation year after year after year, and they're always needing help and always need help, and we want to help, but what I try to do, and I grab people, and I say, listen, please, you get a job, you keep a job, life works out. You don't want to go to work, you don't like the boss, you keep losing your jobs, life is not going to work out, okay? This is very simple, and another thing I've seen so many times is people using a wonderful thing, a good thing, family, marriage as an excuse. Well, I've got to spend time with my kids, so Sunday's the only day we can be together. You're robbing your family of the blessing of being in the Lord's house. You're, they're going to grow up without the habit of going to church. You've, you've blown it, my friend. Hiding behind the wife or the husband, using the other spouse as an excuse not to be faithful to the Lord. God's seen this too. That's why it's in the parable, right? <laughs> Still another person says, I can't go. God's calling. I can't go. I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets, into the alleys, and the towns. Bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, the folks that don't smell so good. What he's saying is, I've called those who thought they were in the spiritual elites, and they had so many other things they could check off why they didn't want to bring, be with me. Now go out and find the broken people. Find the outcasts. Find the lonely people. Find the people that the weight of their sin is, is pushing them into the ground. And then look at this. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still some more room. So we've gone out. and We've got everybody we could. So we're done now, right? He says, no, go back and get more. Then the master told the servant, go out to the roads, the countrysides, the lanes, everywhere you can go, compel them to come into my house so it will be filled. Because a lot of times folks say, well, that's a rich man's house. I don't deserve to be there. Well, that's a church, and I'm not, I'm not a goody two-shoes. I'm, I'm a sinner. I shouldn't be there. Jesus says, go out, go out, chase them down, go get them, grab a hold of them, compel them, bring them in. I tell you, those people that were invited, they're not going to even get a taste of my banquet. The self-righteous, the religious elites, the people that were full of themselves, the people that could check off all these reasons not to be with God, they're not going to even get a scent of the spiritual banquet. They're not going to get a taste. They're not going to get one morsel. Brothers and sisters, we humble ourselves before the living God. And in our brokenness, we accept His grace, and we accept that invitation. We accept that invitation. People miss out on blessings all the time, here and now, in this life, because we think there are other things that are more important. I always tell folks, you know, there, there were blessings on the altar, and you missed it because you didn't come to church. There were blessings right there for you, and you missed it because you didn't join the prayer meeting. There were blessings. Everybody who came was blessed, and you missed it. We find excuses, but you know what? Uh, for a Christian, that's just missing out on blessings we could have had. We've already gotten the blessing of eternal life. We've already got the greatest blessing of all, but there are folks that are going to miss out on eternity, and you know Why? Pride and wrong priorities. Pride and wrong priorities. God wants to invite you to the party. And if you are already in his house, you know what he's telling you? Go out and grab more people and bring them to the party. Did you hear what I said? Look at the heart of the master of the house. What's his will? He says, I want you to go out and, and bring everybody you can. And we say, we already brought everybody you can. He says, now get out there again. Go down every street. In fact, go down every alley. In fact, go down every side road. Go down every sidewalk. Go everywhere you can and grab more people and bring them in. You're going to have to compel some of these folks because they're bruised and beaten up by the world. Broken people do broken things. They're not going to see it right away. You have to, you have to wrestle with them. <laughs> compel them to come in. Because God says, I want my house to be full. Now, we don't just want to fill seats, right? <laughs> right? That's not Christianity. 
We want to see lives transformed. We want to see people in love with Jesus. And if God wants his house to be filled, why should it be okay for us if our little church here is not filled? And, and it's not about us. We want every single church that loves Jesus, we want their houses to be filled. And if they have five services, we want every one of those services to be filled. At every single church that's following the word of God and loving Jesus across the globe. And we should not be okay that the house is empty because God says, you did everything? Okay, here's what you're going to do. Go out there and look for some more because he wants his house to be filled. People are missing out because of religious tradition, because of wrong priorities, because we're so inflated with our egos that we miss God. God wants a big party. God wants to invite you to the party, my sisters and my brothers, those who are bruised, beaten up, and broken by life, and nothing seems to work out for you. The master wants to say to you, Come up here, my friend. When the master calls us friend, he's calling us close to him. Those who are afraid, those who don't fit in, come on up, my friend. Come on up, my friend. And let's, let's reach out our hands and grab the next friend and the next friend and the next friend. We've got a good master. He loves us in our brokenness. He doesn't imagine us to be something we're not. He knows what we are. He loves us. And he's calling us his side. I'm so glad that the master sees my spiritual, uh, what's the word, crippledness, my spiritual brokenness, and he loves me, and he's calling me to his side. He calls me friend. We have a message today for how we do our church. We have a message today for how we should look at the people who are out in the streets on the byways, in the lanes, uh, in the alleys. Let's go and get them. Let's pray. Dear Master, please give us your heart. Lord, I pray that everybody in this church, we have your heart. We love the things that you love. Lord, take our excuses away and replace it with a heart that's eager to run and do your will, to run quickly, to, uh, to love folks, to encourage people. Lord, I pray that our egos are deflated so that we can sit close to one another on cold days. Lord, I pray that you will take us as individuals, as families, and as a church, Lord. Use us for your glory, Lord. Please let people see you because of the way we love. And Lord, help us to have a love for the lost, just like you had uh, when you died for us on the cross. You're so good, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us together this morning. Please bless us and help us to be a blessing to others, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com.